spoke like to Mother. Something about his appearance that was uh, significant. And then there's Jesus. Jesus, the rabbi, or at least he looked a bit like a rabbi. I did a bit of research this week to just try and ascertain exactly when you get descriptions of what Jesus was wearing, whether this was absolutely what a rabbi would wear. And it's a little bit ambiguous. So there are things about his outer cloak, which would be more rabbinic. And, you know, the woman who touched the hem of his garment, the hem where the tassels might be, doesn't say tassels, but it perhaps it was one of those robes. But otherwise, he wore quite ordinary dress, it appears to be. But whatever it is, the fact rests that how we dress will have an effect on those um, that we are, or what we are speaking. And one comment that I feel duty bound to make here, uh, uh, this will be interesting to see what you come back to on this one, but I want to say that in my experience, I have found that appearance is a much more challenging area for women than it is for men. Uh, the women preachers who I've spoken to have told me that they have regularly had their clothing uh, commented on, their hair commented on, their body shape gets commented on, and often by other women. Um, so just want to raise flag that one. And that takes me from appearance into gender. Um, <clears throat> let's just name the sacred cow that according to some Christians, maybe in our churches, women shouldn't preach. So taking the uh, words out of 1 Timothy 2 or 1 Corinthians 14, where it says that women should be silent, therefore they say that this um, applies to women preachers. For a bit of balance, I always go back to uh, Romans 16, where we read Paul saying, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who are in prison with me, they are prominent among the apostles. Here we have Junia, a female who is an apostle. Okay, uh, debate over in my mind for that verse and many other reasons. But there may be opposition being a woman preaching uh, in terms of people's interpretation of that. Here are some things about what women might especially bring to preaching. According to a book I read by uh, uh, called Silence in Heaven, in Heaven, it says this, women see things uh, men don't and are more likely to see the many great women of the Bible, acknowledge issues such as rape, abuse, violence against women, sexuality and procreation issues. And also women are more likely to speak about personality, family, interpersonal relations. So just want to flag up uh, women and men, there seems to be some uh, nuances in terms of what subjects and how women might present. I wonder what us men might do in response. So I, a, uh, I think we need to be aware of this. So flagging up tonight is part of that. Secondly, if we have the authority to do this, to invite women to come and preach. And I wrote down a quick checklist in the last few years of women who've spoken in my church. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, I can think of nine, which uh, which is OK, but it's certainly predominantly men who speak in the church. And just on that, on one occasion a while ago, I was speaking on the pregnancies of Elizabeth and Mary and realising that there were elements of this story that I just couldn't as a bloke really perhaps appreciate. And so I finished the sermon early and handed over to a woman who then finished the sermon for me and gave her particular perspectives. Um, and one other thing is to perhaps think about using a version of the Bible which has inclusive language, um, so not gender specific language. So for example, uh, in uh, the NIV, it will say in Matthew 4, man shall not live by bread alone. But if you were to use the new RSV, new revised sentence, it's, it's non gender specific. So it says, one does not live by bread alone. Um, of course, the man word does mean all people. But I think uh, I've, for many years now, probably for almost 20 years, have used the new RSV, 
and that's been one of the key reasons why I've done that. Um, so appearance, something to consider. Uh, somebody who was preaching ABC about a month ago at the church uh, was wearing dungarees. So that doesn't tell you which gender they were, which I'm not telling you. Um, but the shoulder strap kept falling off. So all for the sermon, it was. And I was quite distracted by that. So just appearance, gender. Um, let's talk about personalities, personality type. So your personality shapes how you preach. Um, there are ways you can discover your personality type. If you've not done a Myers-Briggs profiling or the Enneagram, you can find things like that online to have a go and at least get perhaps some hint as to how your personality is. Um, and that impacts how we preach. So I'll just give you an example of that. If you were somebody who naturally had quite a strong rhetorical style, you might be tempted to say something along the lines of uh, God is a God of goodness and grace. He's the one who abounds in compassionate love. Da, da, da. You could say exactly the same thing in a much more gentle, questioning, wondering style. You could say, have you considered God's nature? Have you noticed God's kindness towards you, his open handed generosity? What do you know of God's love, his love for you? Uh, and so it goes on. So how you present the same truth reflects your own particular personality nature. Being aware of that is quite helpful. Um, fourth thing I want to mention is your own faith your own faith understanding, your own faith journey. Uh, many years ago, before Barack Obama became president, he published two books, uh, The Audacity of Hope, which was a, the title of which he got from a sermon he heard. That's the title of a sermon that he heard. Um, and the other one was called Dreams of My Father, which talks a lot about um, his early activism in politics, living in Chicago. And there's this great bit that I've pulled out and used a number of times where he talks about the black pastors he was working with in downtown Chicago. And he says this, as a group, they turn out to be thoughtful, hardworking men with a confidence, a certainty of purpose that made them by far the best organizers in the neighborhood. They were generous with their time, interested in the issues, surprisingly willing to open themselves to my scrutiny. One minister talked about a former gambling addiction. Another told me about his years as a successful executive and secret drunk. They all mentioned periods of religious doubt, the corruption of the world in their own hearts, the striking of bottom and the shattering of pride, and then finally the resurrection of self as self alloyed to something larger. That was the source of their confidence, they insisted. Their personal fall, their subsequent redemption, it was what gave them the authority to preach the good news. Really interesting how personal story is a motivating factor, is a defining factor, and shapes what we do. An older gentleman in a previous church would tell me, you know, Ash, we are just beggars telling other beggars where to get food. And I, I thought it was a bit simplistic. I, I've grown to love that phrase because it gives a perspective about who I am. That's all I am. That's all I've discovered. And I'm simply inviting other people to, to benefit from that which I have benefited from myself. So think about your own testimony, your own story of faith, your own journey. How do you share that? Um, how do you communicate that you too have been a beneficiary of the goodness and grace that you're offering to other people? And the last one I want to just touch on is self-disclosure. What you might say about yourself. I think Fran's going to pick up on this as well in a bit. Uh, but self-disclosure. I think that self-disclosure should mostly, usually, be self-deprecating. You're not there to big yourself up. Um, that doesn't come across very well. So to use things which are self-deprecating. But occasionally tell a story 
which is an example or a model of discipleship. So Paul did this, obviously, in some of the things that he wrote. Uh, I found myself, we were just talking about giving the other day uh, in church. Uh, we were just about normalising giving. And I stand at the front and I said, I remember at the age of 18 getting my first job and uh, the church secretary, Gerald, came up to me and said, Ashley, there you are. There's your giving form to do your tithe. So I dutifully filled it out. And that was when I was 18. That was 40 years ago. And I've been doing it ever since. Now, that was a model thing. I hope that wasn't blowing my trumpet. It was just about a practice that I'd come to use. So self-deprecating normally, occasionally models and examples. And I want to tell you that I guess as I've gone on preaching, I've kind of grown in confidence to become more self-disclosing about myself. Um, I may be a product of getting older. I'm not so bothered anymore. Um, it may be, in part, a product of the fact that seven years ago I had a breakdown. So there you go. I've just been disclosing in telling you that I've had a breakdown. Uh, but that may have softened me somewhat or maybe less uh, uh, bothered about how I come across. Um, so some of the things I've said in church have in the last two or three years included this. Um, I've talked about race and I've spoken about my experience growing up in the 70s uh, and the racist jokes which were told across my family's Sunday dinner table after church. And more recently on leading the church through a church-wide conversation about LGBT plus inclusion, I talked to the church on Sunday morning about the homophobia that existed in our home, that I was growing up in a, in a Christian home back in those days. Um, we need to think about what is an appropriate level of self-disclosure. When does it come too much? When does it, as one congregation member, what put me to me, uh, said, we don't like people who just bleed all over the congregation. And that's an interesting phrase. So there is self-disclosure that we can give, but there are some questions around that. And just one little note here. Um, we might also talk about our families. And if we have kids, we might talk about our kids. And I have had ministers kids tell me of the horror of walking out of the youth group to coffee at the end of church and having the congregation look at them, raise their eyebrows, uh, reference a story that dad probably has just told to 50, 100 people and how horrific that was. Um, uh, be careful. Um, we have a little agreement in our family. So I have three daughters. They're all in their 20s now. So, uh, But when they were younger, I read an article uh, by a columnist in the national press who would uh, tell stories about his family. But the deal was, if you were mentioned in dad's column, you got a fiver. So that was transposed to my preaching. So the family all know that if they get referenced in a sermon, ka-ching, everyone gets, a, they all get a fiver. So uh, I kind of, I, I slowed down a lot on that um, for doing that. Um, just be aware that there is intentional self-disclosure and unintentional self-disclosure. So intentional is me starting a sermon saying, well, a really interesting thing happened to me on the bus the other day. Let me tell you about that. I'm telling you a story. Unintentional, you get kind of passionate about justice or poverty and you're getting that. You're not meaning to disclose something, but simply by the way you're getting animated about it, you are um, perhaps unintentionally disclosing something about uh, who you are and what's passionate, what you're passionate about. So what have we covered? We covered appearance and gender. It's going through my notes now in front of me. Uh, we've looked at, oh, you've got it all written down probably. Um, where's the last one? Here it is. Uh, personality type, how your own faith story might come across 
and self-disclosure, appropriate levels of that, uh, what's intended and what's unintended. Uh, got a couple of questions uh, for you. 